SpaceX says it's developing a simplified lunar landing mission architecture to get humans back to the moon faster. Really? And how exactly is that supposed to work? So, in case you haven't heard, SpaceX just dropped a huge update about their Starship Human Landing System, or HLS. In the update, they said, Since the contract was awarded, we have been consistently responsive to NASA as requirements for Artemis III have changed and have shared ideas on how to simplify the mission to align with national priorities. In response to the latest calls, we've shared and are formally assessing a simplified mission architecture and concept of operations that we believe will result in a faster return to the moon while simultaneously improving crew safety. That's big. So what does it actually mean? Are they literally developing a different system now? As most of you probably know, this seems to be a response to growing criticism from both current and former NASA officials, including the agency's acting administrator, Sean Duffy, who've said SpaceX has been falling behind on developing their HLS version of Starship. On October 20th, Duffy said he planned to open up the 2021 contract SpaceX won for the Artemis III lander. NASA later confirmed it had asked both SpaceX and Blue Origin, which has its own HLS for Artemis V, to submit proposals by October 29th, outlining ways to speed up their lunar lander development. Then, at an October 29th conference, former NASA administrators Charlie Bolden and Jim Bridenstine expressed skepticism that the current Starship-based design could get astronauts on the moon before China's first planned crewed mission, currently projected for 2030. Bridenstein, who now works as a lobbyist for several space companies, even suggested the government consider a crash program to develop a new lander, possibly using the Defense Production Act. In response, SpaceX posted a detailed thread on X, pushing back and pointing out that Bridenstine's comments should be taken with a grain of salt, since he's a paid lobbyist for companies that directly compete for NASA contracts. But long story short, SpaceX clearly understands what NASA's worried about, and they're now working on a simplified, faster approach to get back to the moon, one that could actually meet NASA's tight Artemis timeline and improve crew safety in the process. What simplified likely means in practice? SpaceX hasn't published detailed schematics, but a pragmatic approach to simplification probably means reducing the number of moving parts. That could look like fewer tanker flights by trimming cargo mass, shorter lunar surface stays with a two-astronaut crew, and streamlined rendezvous operations in a stable lunar orbit. Each of these steps reduces potential failure points, while keeping the mission's core goal intact, safely transporting astronauts from lunar orbit to the surface and back to Orion. This approach also aligns neatly with NASA's near-term priorities, robust abort options, straightforward docking, and proven life support systems before attempting longer stays or heavier payloads. In other words, prove the latter works before loading it with more weight. How simplified SpaceX's new Starship plan turns out to be really depends on how aggressive they want to get. Elon Musk has already hinted on X that Starship will end up doing the whole mission, which could mean SpaceX is considering taking on the entire lunar landing process with Starship alone, no Orion or SLS in the loop. To be fair, they've already checked off most of the milestones needed to even think about that. Starship has reached orbital velocity, performed successful in-space engine relights, and even survived re-entry. The two big items still on the list are in-space refueling and the actual lunar landing. Of those, refueling might sound intimidating, but compared to everything else SpaceX has accomplished, it's probably the easier of the two. Lunar landing, on the other hand, is the real challenge. That said, some of the other steps often mentioned, like crude Earth landing and upper stage reuse, aren't strictly necessary for a moon mission. SpaceX could easily keep Dragon in the mix for that. In that scenario, Dragon would handle astronaut transport to and from low Earth orbit, while Starship takes care of everything beyond that. Starship would only need to aero break back into LEO, where the crew could transfer to Dragon for the trip home if a direct Earth landing in Starship still feels too risky. By the time Starship actually lands humans on the moon, we'll probably be a lot more comfortable with the idea of crewed Starship launches and landings anyway. When that happens, the mission architecture becomes elegantly simple. A single Starship handles liftoff from Earth, refueling in LEO, translunar injection, refueling again in lunar orbit, landing on the moon, surface operations, ascent back to orbit, another refuel, and the return to Earth. It's a fully integrated system, relying on just one spacecraft type and however many tanker and depot missions are needed to fill the propellant depots in both Earth and lunar orbits. The only problem is that NASA might not be ready to commit to that kind of all-in starship approach yet, for political, technical, and programmatic reasons.
so a simplified architecture might end up being a compromise instead, one that still leans on the most proven and available hardware. That likely means continuing to use Orion for crew transport, since it's currently the only vehicle certified to bring astronauts safely home from lunar distance. And as much as people criticize it, the SLS remains the fastest way to get Orion into orbit or high Earth orbit, especially since so much of its funding is already locked in. If NASA and SpaceX really want to speed things up to stay ahead of China, a hybrid approach using Starship for lunar landing and Orion slash SLS for crew transport might be the most pragmatic, simplified plan in the near term, even if the ultimate goal is for Starship to eventually do it all. Unfortunately, SpaceX didn't go into detail about what this simplified approach actually is. Unless it's something fundamentally different from the original plan, it's hard to see how it would make a huge difference on its own. But honestly, that's not something to be bummed about, because this update gives us more new and interesting info about Starship HLS than we've had in a long time. For one, we finally got a sense of its true scale, and it's massive. I knew it was going to be big, but the numbers still blew me away. According to the update, a single starship has a pressurized habitable volume of over 600 cubic meters, which is roughly two-thirds the entire pressurized volume of the International Space Station. And that's just one vehicle. It also includes a scalable crew cabin designed for large teams of explorers and dual airlocks for surface operations. To put that in perspective, each of Starship's airlocks alone has about 13 cubic meters of habitable space more than double what astronauts had inside the Apollo lunar lander. And the cargo variants of Starship? Those will be able to land up to 100 metric tons of payload directly on the lunar surface. That's exactly the kind of capacity we'll need for delivering heavy equipment. Things like unpressurized rovers, pressurized habitats, nuclear power units, or entire base modules. So when we talk about scale here, it's honestly beyond anything we've ever seen or even proposed for lunar missions before. Starship isn't just an incremental step forward. It's a complete reimagining of what a human lunar lander can be. The update doesn't mention what's actually inside the Starship HLS, but we did get some really cool new images showing what it might look like. One of them in particular is fascinating. It gives us a glimpse of the cockpit interface that astronauts will use. It looks very familiar if you've seen the inside of Crew Dragon. Just like Dragon, there aren't a bunch of old-school knobs, switches, or joysticks. Instead, the control surface is dominated by a massive touchscreen that handles nearly everything. It's clean, futuristic, and very SpaceX. Now, take a look at this other angle. When the astronaut is looking up inside the ship, can you spot what's missing? That's right, there's no header tank. For those not familiar, the header tanks are small, insulated tanks that store the landing propellant separately from the main tanks. They exist to reduce propellant boil-off, prevent sloshing during re-entry, and allow for stable engine performance during landing. If you just left a small amount of fuel in the massive main tanks, it would slosh around uncontrollably, which could mess up the vehicle's handling. Plus, you'd have to keep the entire main tank pressurized all the way down, which isn't ideal. So, by moving the landing fuel to smaller header tanks, SpaceX ensures those tanks stay completely full and stable during descent, a much better setup for precise landings. But Starship HLS doesn't need to land back on Earth. That changes the design completely. In place of the header tanks, that upper area now houses the docking system that will connect Starship to Orion in lunar orbit. This setup allows astronauts to transfer between the two spacecraft in space. SpaceX wrote in the update that its HLS team has completed 49 milestones tied to the development of all the subsystems, infrastructure, and operations needed to land astronauts on the moon. They also emphasized that they've only received payment for milestones that have actually been completed, and the vast majority of those have been finished on time or even ahead of schedule. Some of the highlights are really worth talking about. One of the big ones is the Lunar Environmental Control, Life Support, and Thermal Control System demonstrations. SpaceX built a full-scale cabin module, large enough for multiple people, to test how well the system can inject oxygen and nitrogen into the cabin atmosphere, 
control humidity and temperature, manage air circulation and sanitation, and even monitor the acoustic environment. Another key milestone is the qualification of the docking adapter, the system that will connect Starship and Orion in lunar orbit. It's an androgynous docking system, meaning it can function as either the active or passive side, depending on which vehicle it's connecting to. The design itself is based on the flight-proven Dragon 2 docking system, which already has a solid track record. They also completed a landing leg drop test, using a full-scale article at realistic landing energies onto simulated lunar regolith. That's a big deal. What's cool is that they're not testing tiny models. These are full-scale landing legs dropped at lunar gravity equivalents to study how they interact with regolith and absorb impact forces. Even though the moon's gravity is only one-sixth of Earth's, Starship's mass still means those legs have to be much stronger than Falcon 9's. There's also talk that they could be self-leveling, which would be a huge advantage for landing on uneven terrain. Next up is the Raptor Lunar Landing Throttle Test, which demonstrated how the engines can smoothly throttle through a representative lunar descent profile, a crucial capability for a vehicle this large trying to land gently in low gravity. Then there's micrometeoroid and orbital debris testing, where they analyzed different combinations of shielding, insulation, and window materials to protect Starship from impact hazards and extreme thermal conditions in space. The landing software, sensor, and radar demonstrations were also important. These tests helped validate the hardware and software that will guide Starship during descent and ensure it can autonomously locate and land precisely on the lunar surface. No small feat given the moon's lighting and terrain challenges. SpaceX also completed a software architecture review, mapping out all the major control systems, which computers they'll run on, how fault detection and warning systems will work, and how command and telemetry data will flow between spacecraft and ground control. They ran Raptor cold start demonstrations too, using both sea level and vacuum optimized engines. These were pre-chilled before ignition to simulate what it's like starting up engines after sitting in the cold void of space for hours or even days. Another must-have for a lunar landing. The Integrated Lunar Mission Operations Plan review covered how SpaceX and NASA will actually run the mission together, flight rules, crew procedures, and overall mission planning. It's a big sign that both sides are already syncing up operationally. There was also a depot power module demonstration, testing the prototype electrical systems that will power the orbital propellant depots, critical for long-term lunar logistics. They even tested radio frequency communications between flight-equivalent ground stations and vehicle systems proving that Starship can maintain reliable data and voice links across the mission profile. And one of my favorite parts, the elevator and airlock demonstration. This was done in partnership with Axiom, using flight representative EVA suits to practice how astronauts will move between the cabin and the lunar surface. Finally, there's the medical system demonstration, which tested Starship's onboard medical equipment and its telemedicine capabilities, allowing real-time communication between the crew and medical teams on Earth, an essential safety feature for long-duration missions. And to wrap it up, SpaceX has also activated the hardware-in-the-loop testbed for the upcoming propellant transfer flight test. This setup uses flight representative hardware to simulate and test how Starship will actually move propellant between vehicles in orbit, one of the most critical technologies for making the whole lunar architecture work. All of this shows just how far along the HLS program really is, not just on paper, but in hardware, software, and real-world testing.